new beginning. New beginning. New beginning. New beginning. Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast. My name is Sean Ram alongside Dr. Joshua Black. Beautiful day here um, in Canada. <laughs> Lots of uh, beautiful sunshine, and uh, we're enjoying it. And I hope you're enjoying your day wherever you are. So let's get right into it. Amy Valella entered into politics after the death of her daughter, uh, Shalin. Uh, Shalin's needless death at the hands of the U.S. profit-driven healthcare system. Losing Shalin became a defining moment in her life. The transformation out of grief and into a position of strength was a long journey. Although her life has been full of struggle and more recently tragedy, Her experiences have strengthened her resolve in the fight for justice. Her journey is shown in the 2019 documentary on Netflix, Knock Down the House, which follows four female progressive candidates as they campaign against prominent incumbents in the 2018 midterm elections. Amy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I saw the Netflix special. I reached out to you and I'm so grateful that you said yes and were able to come on here and talk about your journey, just because it's so unique on how a loss of your daughter has actually propelled you into politics, which I haven't heard about that yet in my journey with grief and talking with the brief. So this is the first time for me to sort of uh, see this and hear your your story. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, I think it's so important to talk about that journey. Um, Not often that we have an opportunity to actually talk about what that looks like. Uh, and so I'm I'm very excited to be here and, and have that opportunity. So I'd like to, if you could just like shortly touch on your life with your daughter and if she was your first child and what that was like for you as a mom. This one was my firstborn. I was a teenage mother and uh, she was, as most parents will probably be able to relate to, she was the the one that taught me how to love, what love really was. It was tough. I was, you know, young and and dumb, <laughs> not knowing really what I was doing. Um, there was a lot of struggle raising her. Um, I was also I was married to her father, who was my childhood sweetheart. Um, but eventually, you know, poverty and um, youth took its toll. So I ended up being a single mom. And raising her really taught me how to fight, you know, for my children, and and make sure that they had the best I could possibly provide for them. It was tough. I mean, there were times that we went without. There was times that we were homeless. There was times that, you know, I had to be on government assistance. Uh, and But those times also motivated me to want more for my children. I didn't want them to go down the path I had gone through. And so I rolled in night school and, and went to college at night. It was another sacrifice for my kids, but it also taught them how to, to you know, fight and, and actually, you know, overcome struggle. Um, eventually, I did get my my degree in accounting and uh, was working my way up through the business ladder. My children saw that. They were there the day that I graduated college. And I, I remember looking out and seeing Shalin, and she had just this beaming look on her face. She was so proud. And, you know, I know that it had an effect on her that she became very involved in school and she was uh, an honor roll student. She graduated with honors from high school and was in school to become a nurse. So we had a very, uh, you know, a, a very typical uh, mother-daughter relationship, especially for, you know, the struggling class uh, Americans, you know, where you, your children who come out of that environment, they become very robust and strong. And, and that's what Shalin was. She was a very strong, strong woman. Uh, and of course, she did give me her moments of terror <laughs> when she was a teenager, <laughs> which, you know, anybody has daughters <laughs> understands. Um, and we were finally at that point at the age of, you know, 22 before she died, where we were learning what it was to be adult friends. And that was a really special period for me. Wow, that's really beautiful. You you were able to have that, you switched almost that relationship from being that mother to being like her best friend and to have that kind of one-on-one connection. I wish I had that, you know, with my, with some of the people in my life um, and relatives today. So I think that's amazing that you're able to, to get there. And what was that transition like for you when you're looking back on that now? Like, was it, was it a hard transition or did it just happen because she became more mature? She really just became more mature. I you know, think from them having a life of struggle, my children 
really had the ability to have insight possibly more than other people their age. And I remember her, her telling me, you know, Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was such a, a hard teenager. And I was like, absolutely not. You know, this is part of growing up. But she had that insight to see, you know, the dynamics of a growing, maturing woman and her mother. And she was very excited about the opportunity uh, for us to get close closer than we were. So it's one of the reasons she had, a, at the age of 22, that she decided to move from Kansas City, where she was at, uh, and transition her schooling into Las Vegas, where I was, uh, where my husband had been restationed in the military. So that's one of the reasons why she came out to Las Vegas. She wanted so badly to reconnect with her younger brothers and, and really help our relationship blossom. Wow. That's wild. So she, was it hard for you when she left? when she left Kansas City to come to where I was living? Um, no, I actually, you know, she was kind of a go-getter, like like I am. She just kind of puts her mind to it, and she's like, that's done. So it was one night, she's like, I'm thinking about, you know, transferring my schooling out to Las Vegas and living with you guys. Is that okay? And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then the next phone call was, I'm coming out there on May such and such, and I'll be driving, and I'm taking my best friend, and I've already started applying to get my CNA license transferred. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wow, that quick. <laughs> yes. Yes. She was She was like, the, that's the way she was. She was just determined. Mm. And so I'm guessing you said, like, because she was closer to you, I'm guessing the bond also was able to be strengthened a little bit more, too. Yes. Yes. Mm. I think most parents go through this. It's it's that time period in their teenage years where, you know, it depends on the child and the family dynamics. But I think a lot of people probably would say they have the same experience with their kids where, you know, I used to joke with her. I'm like, I don't know if you're going to make it till you're 18. Like, I'm really questioning. <laughs> you're just so off the hook. Like, really, you're just you're I used to always play with her. And she'd start laughing. But you know, she just was really difficult. And she went through that rebellious stage, you know, and I think that's pretty typical, uh, especially with a mother-daughter relationship. I, I've met some mothers who are very fortunate and never have to go through that struggle. But for the most part, any mother-daughter I've ever spoken to, they, they have that, that, at varying degrees, that level of struggle where their daughter is becoming a woman. Right. And I was curious too, did she live with you when she moved to Las Vegas or was she living in residency? She was living with me. Oh, she was living with you. Okay. Wow. Yes. All right. So can you take us through how you learned about her death and what happened with that? Sure. So, you know, going through all the struggle we went through, you know, I I was always, you know, believed the, the false narrative that if we do everything we're supposed to do, if you work hard and you provide that would be that you're safe and your family is safe. And so, you know, I became this career driven businesswoman. I mean, career driven. I mean, I became a CFO when she came out there. I was on the way out the door actually, as she was coming in um, to town to go on a, uh, a business trip for a retreat for our company, for the executives. And so I, I barely got to speak to her. Um, had a friend come in and then I was gone. She, the first, when she was there, she told me after she drove 20 some hours, she said, mom, look at my leg. It's swollen and it's starting to turn red. And I'm like, well, you probably just sat on it wrong. You know, in my infinite, you know, medical knowledge, (laughs) that's what I told her. And I'm like, just see how it feels. You know, well, within within a day of me being out of town, I get a phone call from her. And she had fallen on it. So in addition to her already being red and, and swelling, then she fell on it, put, horsing around. And she's crying. And she says, we're at the emergency room. And they're asking me for my insurance. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, why are you calling me for this? She's like, well, should we call TRICARE? And I'm like, yeah. So TRICARE is government insurance for the military members, okay? So, they, so then I get another phone call. She called me again. Well, we called TRICARE, and they're saying I don't qualify. Well, she didn't qualify because, again, we have all of these holes and these cracks in our healthcare system coverage. And in the military, the crack 
is that between the ages of 21 and 23, if they're not actively going to school, they do not qualify. They don't have the same protections as the civilian population does right now. So because she had en she had en enrolled and been accepted but had not started that semester yet, she did not qualify to be on our insurance. So my response to her was, just be seen. Tell them what's wrong. Just tell them what's happening. I'm making more than enough money to take care of this. I'll pay worry about paying for it later. Just be seen. Like, I'm in a business meeting. Like, just, just be seen. So she uh, was told at the front desk, uh, my husband was there with her. And so he's able to relay to me what happened. And she was at the front desk. They were telling her, you know, it's going to be very expensive. There's the door. You can leave now. She told him, no, something's really wrong with my leg. So she went to the back. And I get another phone call. And this time she's crying. And she's like, I'm in so much pain. And they won't even give me anything for it. She had an 8 out of 10 pain. They didn't even give her a Tylenol. And then she's like, I'm begging them for diagnostic testing. I know something's really wrong with my leg. Mommy, they're not helping me. They told me to go get insurance and see a specialist. They weren't a doctor's office. They basically uh, did the bare minimum to try to satisfy what's called EMTALA, which is a law that's supposed to protect people from being discriminated against in an emergency room when you don't have insurance. It was enacted by uh, President Reagan in 1986 because back then the people were being turned away and dying in the streets in front of hotel, uh, hospitals. And so um, basically she came back home she applied for the insurance uh, at the government uh, level with uh, in Nevada, and she started sending me text messages showing me different clinics. She was doing as she was instructed, getting insurance and seeing a specialist. The time wasn't on her side, and what we didn't know is that Shalyn had a blood clot. She was black on birth control, just drove 20-some hours on a leg that was healing from an ACL tear, and uh, she had a sickle cell trait. These and sh these are all risk factors for a blood clot. And her leg was already swollen and red. So basically, she had every sign and, and almost every risk factor for a blood clot in her leg. But she had to go back to Kansas City. She had to finalize her paperwork. And we didn't know she had a blood clot. She had already started the process of getting, you know, getting seen in other places, so she's taking pain pills, just trying to hang in there until she could be seen. And um, she got on a plane to go back so she could get the paperwork in order to make sure she started class. And uh, I remember her leaving that morning, and this, this, this is something that's always on my mind. I remember hearing her leave at 5 o'clock in the morning and hearing her the door close, and something in me made me shoot out of bed, and I was like, I should go down and say goodbye. And I was like, oh, I'm being silly. I'll see her in a day. So I didn't go down. And um, the next morning, I got a call from her father. And uh, he was in a way I've never heard him before because she was staying with him in Kansas City. And he's like, Shalyn's coding. And I'm like, what do you mean she's coding? I, I don't understand. What do you mean? Uh, she's 22, and and he's like, she's coding, I got her heart beat back, I don't know what's happening, and he starts bawling, and I'm just like, oh my God, okay, all right, Roscoe, I'm going to come, and I looked at my husband at the time, and I was like, uh, should I go? I mean, maybe she's just having a panic attack or something, like, my mind could not comprehend that my 22-year-old daughter was actually coding, like, you go into that shock, like, no, you must be mistaken, it, it can't be. And he was like, go, go. And so my sister is an RN in Kansas City, and I'm calling her. And I'm like, Ellie, you know, she's in the hospital. She's like, hold on. And she hung up, and she started calling the hospital. I'm driving with my son, Shalyn's uh, brother. They're like 13 months apart. Good friends. He's driving. And Ellie gets back on the phone. She's got me on three ways. She's, uh, she's got me on one phone and the, the hospital another, and she's like, has, has Shalyn been in the hospital? Is what she has like? Well, she was there for a swollen leg. You know, it was red. And my sister, like before say, me saying anything else, is on the other line screaming. You know, pulmonary embolism. Could you help her. It's a pulmonary embolism. And uh, 
Shalyn coded in the ambulance ride, and um, she never regained consciousness. He worked on her 50 minutes. That's how I knew uh, that my daughter was um, possibly going to die. And I remember being in the car as Dudley was talking to me, and I was just screaming, no. I've never heard those kind of screams come out of me, that kind of intense pain. And uh, I told Josiah, you have to come now. It's my son. I'm like, you have to get on a plane. He was in slippers and pajama pants, and he got on a plane. And we just started heading out to Kansas City. And the entire time I was on Facebook, I'm like, is she dead? Is she dead? And I, I can't tell you what that feeling's like. You're not there for your child. And, uh, you know, when I landed, that's the first thing I saw my sisters at the gate. And I'm like, I just fell to my knees. And I was like, please tell me my daughter's alive. You know, and, and I had to go from there to the hospital room. And, uh, you know, someone was intimated by this time. And uh, she was over breathing the ventilator, and so she'd breathe in, and her eyes would flutter open and her roll back. And I just remember sitting there, just please fight, Shalyn, fight, you know. And it, it came a point that we knew she was becoming brain dead, and we had to make a choice about giving the gift of life to others. And uh, we made the choice to have her be an organ donor. And uh, they couldn't use her her main organs; they were too damaged. But uh, we were we she did was able to you know donate um, her heart valve and other things. So we were able to hold her as she passed. And uh, I remember as she was lying in my arms. Uh, it's so crazy as it sounds. It was the best feeling ever. I had not held her like that since she was an infant. And I held her and sang to her the songs I used to sing to her when she was a baby. And I knew at this point something had, some injustice had happened because my sister's on our end. She was putting all the pieces together. And uh, one of the last things I told her, I whispered in her ear, I said, you will not have died in vain. I didn't know what that journey was going to be, but that was the beginning of the journey. I'm really, you know, I, I'm getting annoyed and upset just hearing this story, and I can't even imagine what you and your family went through during that time, I'm really sorry that happened, and it's just uh, it's frustration. It, I, just hearing it's frustrating, hearing that that can actually happen. Oh man, it was tough. I didn't believe it either. I remember sitting at home. My grief process is something else, man. I I didn't want to live for a year. I remember sitting mm. numerous times in front of the mirror with pills in my hand and just like. What kind of country, what kind of world do I live in that no one cares? And I'd be screaming just at the top of my lungs, like, why? You know, and uh, that pain is something like I've never dealt with. It was the most intense pain I've ever known and the most anger. I would just, I'm sure a lot of parents who have lost children due to injustice or even, even without injustice, just the unfairness of losing a child can understand like just the wailing and it's not it's not a sound you can even mimic the wailing is just from your very bottom of your soul and that's where I was stuck for about a year uh, not wanting another day to go by because that's another day without your child so it was tough to say the least so how did you get through that year and to make it to like to make it to where you are now? Because it's pretty inspiring that you are where you are now. So like, what what happened? You know, my husband took care of me the entire year. I had two younger sons still at home who were very young, and he took care of them. He'd bring food to the room. I didn't leave the room. Um, and and this was like two months after. Bernie Sanders announced his run for for president. Mm. I had no idea who he was, but there was all this talk going on about uh, universal health care. And I, my husband's from Brazil, and so he was like, you know, in the other countries, they have, you know, something called like universal health care, where there's there's every citizen has it, and it's not tied to your job. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, the CFO, I'm thinking that's crazy. That's crazy talk. You know, and I'm thinking, how does that work? 
you know, how does that, how do you actually save money? How does, how does it, you know, stay within cost and you know, to be affordable for the person? And so I started, I mean, I, I, that's what started getting me out of my own shell. I started researching everything I could, studying other countries, reading bills that were in the, you know, already on the, the like, already presented before our House and our Senate. And so I started doing math. I started looking at, I started, I also was studying because I was also in a lawsuit. I got that put together to go against the hospital to stop them from, uh, you know, doing more intolerant violations. So I was already starting to research and start, and I was starting to realize, oh my God, it's thirty-five to forty-five thousand a year of people that are losing their loved one, like I lost Shalim. And I started looking up ways to find more about this thing they're calling, you know, Medicare for all. And so I went to a <clears throat> went to a conference, and it was the first time I had left the house. David was just excited that I was my husband. He was just excited to get me out of the house. Like, and I, like, I actually was going to leave the house yeah. to go do something that wasn't just work. And, uh, and so I went and I was scared. I didn't talk to anyone. And, uh, my husband kept talking about this Nina person. He kept on Nina this, Nina that. And I was like, who in the heck is this woman named Nina? Like, <laughs> I needed to know. <laughs> so, um, he actually met Nina Turner in the elevator. He knew who she was. And she's a very, I don't know if you know who she is, but she's a, very powerful woman um and she's uh an advocate um especially for universal health care and, and civil and human rights and um he told her the story in the, the elevator i didn't know he had and um the next thing i know it's her time to talk and all of a sudden she starts telling shalin's story and then she's like and in this great country no 22 year old like shalin should die from a lack of health care. And I remember sitting there in just tears. I mean, I was just a mess were rolling down my face. And I had never heard someone to, at that point, to that point say, your daughter didn't deserve to die. I had it. I didn't know there was people out there that, that, that agreed. I was so wrapped up in my own pain. I couldn't see the community. Uh, and Hearing her start speaking about it made me want to stay. I stayed afterwards, and I came up to her. I waited till everyone was gone. It was just her now left in the auditorium. And I went up, and I just started bawling. And and she was telling me the story about watching her own mother die and the process. And she says, Amy, you have all the bones you need. You have the backbone to be fearless. You have the jawbone to speak truth to power. And you have the wishbone to want more you have all the bones you've got to dig deep you have to dig so deep and then dig deeper are you going to become another victim or are you going to fight back and possibly help save other people that's what i needed to hear and i thought oh hell no i'm i'm not going to be a victim i'm going to fight back that's incredible and you know just inspiring just hearing all that because you know you uh, needed to hear it firsthand and experience it in order to get you motivated and charged up to know that you have the power to go ahead and do that. The importance of you telling uh, Shalin's story and, and telling your story is that, you know, the world, the politicians, news, media, we all get caught up in, in the red tape around it all. Like, you know, just everything becomes a number and, you know, this, this and that. But when it comes down to what we are as people, you know, that should never happen. You know, that situation should never happen. And if, if you just keep that in mind, then those people at that hospital are not sending her to some other place. You know, they're diagnosing her properly. They're giving her the care she needs. If she's, they're just looking at the person as a person, you know, we lose that humanity if we get caught up in the red tape and the bureaucracy of it. And that's why I think the power that you have and the story that you have is, is that that's, that's important because, you know, you know this, lots of people in the world, lots of Canadians, Americans, they're lost if, if they're, they don't feel like, you know, sometimes that society is caring for them you know, because they have these type of uh, situations happen to them. And, you know, right. when, you, when you go up there, the last thing you want to hear is politicians some, talking about something that doesn't reflect your life. 
And yet you're, you know, that's, but you're not doing that. You're, you're right there. You're talking about the number one thing people care about, which is their security and their family. You know, it's, it's, you're the person to do it. You know, it was, it was very scary for me. I mean, we're told this, I think this is kind of universal that we're told that, you know, you have to be from a certain background or pedigree to have a voice in politics. You know, being a single mom and, and not from a background that would be something that you would say be a precursor to being in politics. <laughs> you know, mm. I never really paid attention to politics. I was too busy struggling. And yeah. I always felt like, well, they don't care what I have to say. You know, they don't care about mm. me. It's not for me. And, um, you know, I hated politics. To be honest, I mean, hated it. I just, I didn't understand. And, you know, even going into it, I had to really ready myself because going into this, you have to be ready for the backlash as well. Because yeah. what we have here in the United States is pretty much they have us on, uh, you know, football games, really. You know, you're on this side and I'm on this side. And it's like these issues aren't about sides. This is not a party issue. This is a people issue. You're not protected because you have a D or an R behind your name. You're not protected. This is about we the people and, and, and corruption and greed that's taken over. And you have to be ready when you go into that to know that it is going to feel horrific as they fight you back because this is not just a policy. It's personal. Now you're talking about my daughter who I had to sit there and give her last hug inside of a coffin. They had to pull me away from her. I, I didn't want to leave her knowing that that's the last time. Now you're talking about Shalin. And so it was like this whole process of learning how to just Take that initial like anger and when you want to go just drop kick somebody <laughs> and <laughs> take that and internalize it and then push it back out of power to fight back in a way that's that's effective and is going to help other people because it takes a lot. You know, and I and, and I have to do a shout out to some of these groups that are out there that are specifically for grieving parents like compassionate friends. If it wasn't for me being able to go to those groups and talk to other parents. I don't know that I could have like found the way myself like to have gotten as quickly as I was able to turn around and come back. Um, you know, just being able to talk to other people going through it is a huge help. Um, based off, I was a little bit crazy for running for office after losing my child. I'm like, how it's, it's only been a year and a half. What are you, what are you doing? And I'm like, I, how can I not? How can I not? How can I not? Yeah. And, and nothing is to be an accomplice. Absolutely. And this situation, you know, it just highlights, it highlights the fact that I think um, when we live in these societies, you know, whether Canada or United States, we want, we're, we're seeing that, you know, it makes more sense to have politicians that reflect us and our society. Uh, we kind of gotten away from that. And I think you see that with more women now starting to get into politics, which is great because it's it's evening it out a little more when you, you didn't have that in the past and you had mostly men. Well, that's not exactly a reflection of society. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, you might even have, you know, a lot of politicians who are very wealthy and they don't live in those neighborhoods or, you know, in America, you have a lot of situations where people are voting to send kids to war and they themselves haven't gone to war, I, you know. But that's right. where your situation, if it reflects that, hey, people making these really important decisions, they should also be representative of who's actually in the country and who and what are their actual needs and, and things they find important. Well, that is so true. I mean, I can give one experience I had. I can tell you I was sitting there and I, I used to bring this up as I was running. You know, and they were very nervous when I was running because um, and I got the full full <laughs> uh political establishment dumped on me but I used to always say you know we need people in there that understand the struggle because when you go up and you say things like there was people down here some of our representatives one of them said you know if they didn't buy the cell phones you know maybe they could afford the insurance or go out to Starbucks <laughs> and I'm thinking you know you've never struggled you must not understand what struggle is because yeah. a lot of people are sitting there trying to decide whether to pay the gas or the electric. And they need to have a phone in order to get a job and be able to have connection to the outside world. So that's yeah. a ridiculous conversation. Um, you obviously have no idea what struggle is. 
and what's happening. And if you haven't struggled and you don't understand the cracks in the system and how people, how our system is failing people. I mean, I heard so many mothers. I think the number one thing I heard uh, in the groups I was in of mothers and fathers who have lost their children was from opioid addiction. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this all goes back into not having good legislation here and greed running our system and corruption. And my heart would just sink. And it was like, even though our children died for very different reasons, it was still the core of it was still the same. It was still the same problem. And, you know, when I'm out there, I'm not only out there trying to fight for Schlin. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Nothing I do is ever going to bring her back. It will never make it right. It will never make it whole again. But what I can do is I can fight in her honor and every one of their honors to be a voice for the voiceless and fight for change so we stop the needless death. Um, and, and not only just in this country, but this has gone nationwide now. I never would have known that would have happened. And I hope it empowers other people to have a voice. You know, I'd never thrown the healthcare rally or run for office or even dreamed about it. But, you know, all of this, even though I lost the election, I didn't lose the conversation. And all of this has been moving this country further ahead. And, and not just this country, I'm also doing a documentary with a French filmmaker who is going to be, it's just about healthcare, but it's trying to stop the privatization of the national health care services that's happening in England and in Europe. Oh, amazing. So, you know, it's, it's, it's truly going international and and I'm, I think that um, Shalane would be proud of her mama. I think it would be oh, special to her. Definitely, you know? definitely. I am inspi- so inspired by you, I got to say, like with all the struggles you've been through and all, all the stuff that you're just saying about, you know, you weren't defeated from the loss because the story keeps going. And to not give up and to continue to fight you know, for a better life. And, you know, I think everyone can take that to heart because we feel deflated a lot of times in life and we stay still, but, you know, there are things that we can do to motivate ourselves. And you're one of those people that we can look up to as we fight uh, through all our different struggles. And I'm really curious, as you went on your campaign trail and talked about your daughter's loss, did people open up about their losses to you? And what was that like? All the time. And it was it was hard. Um, it was hard to talk about Shalyn's death all the time. It takes an emotional toll on me. Um, and I think parents would understand that that it's it's hard um, to speak of the death. And I'd have to do that. But that was my gift. And then I would hear other people talk. And, and there was this instant connection. We're all part of a club that none of us want to be a part of. And and people outside of even that club of losing a child you know, just the everyday heartache. And it just motivated me to fight harder. You know, we knew, and if you saw the film, you know, there's a part where I'm talking to AOC and she's like, for one of us to win, a hundred of us have to run. We all knew that going in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were so many of us that they were concentrating on. They couldn't possibly get all of us. That's (laughs) how you start a movement. That's how you start a movement. They were so worried about me. They were missing out on AOC. Crowley was donating to my opponent. I had all the caucuses. I had an ex-president, an ex-vice president, current presidential candidate now, different senators and congresspeople from across the nation all coming out for my opponent who didn't even live in the district and registered to vote in in Nevada the same day he registered to run. And so they flew him in when they saw that this, okay, wait a minute, we can't let her win. (laughs) We can't let her, but that's okay because it opened the opportunity all of us together, I'm not just saying it was just my campaign, but all of us together, we got we got a couple in. And this year we're going to get more in and we'll keep on hitting that. So never be afraid of what you would consider, quote unquote, failure. Because we might have lost our, a lot of races across this nation. But if you look at what's happening right now in our presidential uh, campaign right now for the Democratic side, what do they have an answer? Do you support Medicare for all? Where are your donations coming from? Do you support a Green New Deal? These are all things that all of us on these slates ran as. Um, so, you know, I always look at it like this change doesn't happen overnight. 
and you know even people who are iconic like Martin Luther King and and Gandhi I mean they paid the ultimate price right but they started something they planted the seed but others have had to continue to water to actually see the full benefits of it right that's the same thing here and uh, and I was very happy to be a part of that and to give people hope that the conversation changed in Las Vegas and people started feeling hope and seeing there could be different ways and we just have to keep building on that across the United States. That's that's tremendously exciting to hear. It, it's I haven't been, the, you know, I haven't felt like that about a politician since Jack Layton, rest in peace, who's a Canadian politician, who, uh, you know, spoke about a lot of the same things and had the same passion about, you know, um, the regular folks like all of us. And 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 that's that's just incredible. And the, you know, there's a fire there. And you know, as pioneers, it's is obviously going to be some difficult stuff, uh, difficulties um, and challenges. But there, you guys have momentum, and, and I think that it's going to be tremendously tough to slow that down. Oh, yes. They're trying now with everything they can, but it's not going to stop. And it, I can't tell you what it felt like the first time I was in a um, in an actual march for health care, and I was holding this, the signs that Shalene was based on it. And, you know, someone walked up to me, and he's like, the daughter's with you today. It was an older gentleman. And she's like, and she's happy. And I just started bawling. You know, I don't know what the afterlife is. I know I had lots of dreams about her and I am constantly feeling like I have her strength with me. But that was very touching and being there and seeing this mass group of people and everyone trying to fight to ensure that no other parents will either lose their children and or loved ones or friends due to this kind of injustice uh, is, is so heartening. I'm curious, you mentioned uh, dreams you've had of her. Can you share something or one of your most memorable ones you've had of her? Yeah, I, soon after she passed, I remember, I felt like, and, and mo- a lot of the times, it's not been so much recently, but throughout the years, there'll be four years and a few days. Um, it was so real. It was like, I would wake up thinking she had been there. And most of my dreams are me begging on the hospital door saying, please help her. She has a blood clot. You know, I'm trying to get her help. And I'm I'm telling her, I'm so sorry, Shalyn. And uh, one time in the dream, she came to me and she was talking to me in the dream and she was like, it's okay, mom, I'm okay. It's going to get me crying. That felt very real. Then I woke up, and I would I would wake up every morning. Even now, sometimes I wake up, but especially in the beginning, and I would just be like, <gasps> when I'd wake up, because it was like, oh my God, she's dead. You know, you can't, your mind cannot grasp with that, that your child is gone. And there's many times I still do that. I wake up, and I've had a dream about her, and a memory, or that she's a going to college or that we're going someplace together and we're talking or I'm trying to find her. Uh, you know, I know that she's there. I'm like, yeah, she just got a hold of me. I'm looking for her. Have you seen her? And then you have to wake up. And then the tears sting your cheeks and you realize it's like you've lost them all over again. Wow. That's, uh, thank you for sharing those, all the different types of dreams that, that you have. And, is it, do you have any comfort in seeing her again? Or is it just always a sadness when you wake up that stays with you? It's sadness. Mm-hmm. Um, I really lost any ounce of faith I had before. And I'm, sometimes I'm jealous of people who have faith because it seems to make it a little bit more bearable. But um, I feel totally lost. I don't know. I don't know, like, I don't have any set firm beliefs on what's where she's at or if she's anywhere or what's happened. And uh, that's almost unbearable. Yeah, I, so I can't it, imagine. That makes it more difficult. I'm always like, man, I'm, I wish I was, like, super religious. <laughs> <It'd be a laughs> lot. That would be a lot better, actually. <laughs> I guess what people do is they just fight for it. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> that's, that's really what it is. But... uh because yeah, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have faith in the midst of loss, and it's one of probably the most challenging things people go through when it comes to the religion, and also other things that they see that either their politicians or their country, what they do in the name of religion is probably very difficult. But death has got to be one of those individual yes. things that 
that really shakes people's core. And it's, that's what it did to you. And you're not finding meaning in the sense of religion, but you're finding meaning in the sense of making her legacy mean something, making her death mean something by fighting and fighting for other people. And I think you're doing that without religion, which is a very beautiful thing. Cause there's no reward at the end kind of thing, right? You're not doing it to get a reward. You're doing it to do it because it needs to be done. It's right. It's the right thing to do. So amazing, amazing for you to be able to do that. And I, you know, I said, I wish, you know, like as you move forward, those dreams become comforting to be able to see her um, and not have to wake up and say, oh my God, she's dead. But to be able to, to have that moment where you say, you know, like I did this for you kind of thing. Like you, I know you're dead. Even have a dream knowing she's dead. So you're not shocked when you wake up, but then to have like that conversation right. with her or something. Right. So it's not a shock. It's like you've acknowledged the loss in the dream may help and i hopefully have something like that in the future because there's one thing that i do know when it comes to these dreams is they can provide comfort for people and that continuing bond experience and that seems to be helping people as they move forward in their journey but i say right now it's still a, it's still a struggle it's still a struggle to have those experiences for you yeah um, so you know like i don't i don't I like hearing that the fight. struggle yeah and that, you said you're, you're still fighting and you're continuing to fight and you continue to share a story so you know like i wonder i wonder when things move forward when those dreams will change or when your perspective perspective on those dreams will change. But I, you know, let's say you're doing a lot for, for all of us. So thank you for that. We asked one last question at the end of our podcast. And that is if you could have a dream tonight of her, what would it be? You could also say you don't want a dream. That, that's also appropriate. Oh, I, I dream about this often, actually. It's not what I mentioned, but that we're actually winning universal health care and she's with me sitting there. Yeah. And she will be regardless when it happens, no matter what the form. That's something, uh, mm -hmm. I should tell you this, this is a good story and then just to end it with, but uh, you know, I was like many parents and I used to want to uh, have the necklace with her ashes. She wanted to be cremated. Um, and so she also wanted me to get a tattoo before she died. A week before and I was like absolutely not I'm 20 I'm 40 some years old I'm a businesswoman no and after she died I um, went and got a memorial tattoo all across my I mean it's like the whole entire of my body 36 hours worth I took the tattoo she wanted and then we made it into a creation with her ashes in the in the ink so I always have my daughter hugging me and holding me and holding me up and she's always with me no matter what she's there and I will, you know, live the rest of my life trying to honor hers by helping others and uh, making sure if we can just save one life, one life. I know that Shalin, and she wanted to be a nurse. She was into caring for people. She had notes from parents from the elderly patients she was with that were like, thank you so much for taking care of my parents. They said you sing to them and you spent time with them and just thank you. I know Shalin was caring like that. So you can save one life. It's worth it. It's worth it the fight with it definitely thank you amy so much for sharing your story and coming on it was very inspiring to me i'm just curious where can people find you and where can they donate i'm guessing you'll be running again so it's motivating me where can people help you out um, to help you get elected it's amy the number four the people.com and, and that's also my twitter and my uh instagram uh handles amy for the people Excellent, Amy. I think um, you did an amazing job. And again, want to honor uh, Shalyn's memory. And you're doing that. And obviously with the, the work you're doing and the beautiful tattoo. And I think these are great. We encourage that, you know, in order to, you know, obviously, you know, remember the loved one and, and to honor them. Amy, again, if I was American, I would definitely vote for you. If I was in Nevada, I would vote for you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, we should say, yeah, we should actually, I don't think we stated that. So what district are you in and where can, like, where do people Well, I'm in you? the 4th district. I, I definitely am going to be running again. I'm still weighing my options for this particular run, um, but I am gearing up for that. Um, I'm also writing a book on the whole process, the, the, whole, the whole journey that I went through um, that will be out probably sometime in the fall. And uh, I'm going to be helping a certain, uh, a certain man hopefully become the next president of the United States. And you probably can guess. <laughs> I'm Ooh, helping that's out. That's exciting. But, yeah. So I'm still trying to decide where I'm best helping right now. I mean, running for office, for office um, 
it also needs to be strategic on the timing and we also have to have enough funds going into it to be able to to run a grassroots campaign you don't need as much money as others but you do need to have enough to be able to run so we're do- doing some strategizing around that um, and making sure that we're putting all of the energy where we need um, and deciding the timing on everything amazing stuff and can't wait to to hear more about that um, you'll we'll definitely have to have you back on when you uh, release your book or be- before you release your book so we can promote that and have you on and uh, yeah everybody just to, just to reiterate please check out that documentary on Netflix Knock the House Down Knock yeah. Down the House Knock Down the House <laughs> <laughs> the other one might be some comedy you can knock the house down Ferrell. too <laughs> <laughs> both do both um, do both thank you everyone uh, please check out our platform at griefdreams.ca for more information on the topic we added a donation button and there are perks to those who donate if you have Facebook you can join the Grief Dreams group you can share your dreams or hear more dreams of others uh, we are on Twitter and Instagram at Grief Dreams and uh, we'd like to end our show with love and gratitude from us to you Beautiful. introduced myself you have introduced yourself this is a very good conversation